Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCray. If you've ever known somebody who had and passed a kidney stone, they may have told you that it's the worst pain they've ever had. Mm. Kidney stones are hard deposits made up of salts and minerals that form inside your kidneys. Why do they form? Do we know? Well, we're going to find out. (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) Why do some people have them and others don't? How are they treated? And most importantly, can they be prevented? Joining us in studio is a kidney stone expert, the chair of the Department of Urology at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona, Dr. Mitchell Humphreys. Welcome to the program, Dr. Humphreys. It's nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, good to have you in Rochester. It's nice to be here, especially with the sun shining and warm weather. Oh, yeah, this is (laughs) almost like Phoenix, isn't it? (laughs) Just about. Now, here's what you probably didn't know, Tracy. Mitch Humphreys' mother and I went to high school together. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's true. Uh, and now his mother is married to one of my best friends from high school. It's a small world. Oh, it is. Mitch, it's so good to see you. It's Dr. Humphreys. Oh, now. Dr. Humphreys. Yeah. Very good. So why do people get kidney stones? So uh, people do get kidney stones for a variety of reasons, and it can be dietary, it can be environmental, or it can be genetic. Um, what we do know about kidney stones is if you think about it, the kidneys are just a filter. They filter a quarter of your blood supply every minute. So the way that that filter works and takes care of minerals and waste, that's going to increase your risk of stones. So some people may filter more calcium. Some people may filter more salts. If people are dehydrated, they've got risk. If you've got family members with stones, you've got a two-time full increased risk Mm -hmm. of getting kidney stones. So it can be inherited. So um, you don't just get your good looks from your parents anymore. You can also get stones from them as well. So there's a variety of reasons that lead to kidney stones. More common in males than females? So the early epidemiology data was it was three to one more common in uh, males than females. But if you look at the contemporary literature in 2018, 19, now the ratios are starting to even out where females are just as lucky as men uh, when it comes to kidney stones. Oh, there you go. So lucky. What about diet? Any Does that have anything to do with it? Yeah, so diet has a big impact on kidney stones. Perhaps one of the biggest risk factors is not enough fluid intake. So what we tell people is we want you to drink enough. We don't care what you drink, although there is some data to suggest what you drink is important. But the most important thing is volume. Think of stones as a chemistry. The more diluted your urine is, the harder it is for crystallization or mineralization to occur. So you really want to drink more fluid, flush that system out. The goal is about two and a half liters a day. The second most important thing of kidney stones is salt. Because when you eat salt and your kidney filters salt, when your kidney filters that salt, it pulls calcium with it, and that increases your risk of stones. And if you take medications to prevent kidney stones, that salt will essentially inactivate those medications and make them not worthwhile. So unfortunately, salt is in everything we do. Not only does it make things taste better, but it's in preservatives, anything that comes out of a bag, box, can, um, even vegetables are frozen in salt water. So it just means raising awareness. You said two and a half liters of fluid a day. So the Mm -hmm. people who say you should drink seven to 10 glasses of water a day, they're right? Depends, right? So if you spend a lot of time talking like I do, you're going to lose a lot of fluid just by talking. Or if you work out a lot, you're going to lose a lot of fluid by sweating. We care about what you actually make in the plumbing system. So we care about how much you pee. So if seven to eight glasses a day is enough for you to pee two and a half liters, then that's adequate. If it's not, you're losing what we call insensate water loss from talking, from exercise, then you need to up your game and increase your fluid more. Now that recommendation is more for people that have already had kidney stones. For people that don't have kidney stones and don't have a risk of kidney stones, you don't necessarily have to push those fluids unless you're in a dry air environment, say Phoenix, for example. Um, our goal there is to be over two liters. Okay. The only thing that I know about kidney stones is that they're a lot of pain, very, very painful. What are other symptoms of kidney stones? <clears throat> yeah, so one big thing is pain. Obviously, that's the first telltale sign. Sometimes kidney stones can cause blood in the urine, usually blood that you can see. Sometimes people don't know that they have kidney stones and they go to their doctor and their doctor says, well, you have blood in your urine, but it's microscopic blood you can't see. And then they get imaging tests and that reveals a kidney stone. So not all kidney stones have symptoms, but when they do have symptoms, it typically occurs with pain, blood in the urine. You may get nauseated. You may feel sick to your stomach, uh, among other things. And the pain typically located in the flank? So typically it's in the flank and the back, depending on the location of the stone. So as the stone travels from the kidney and down the narrow tube that drains from the kidney to the bladder called the ureter, 
the pain may change in location and character. So that pain may start in the back. It may start to radiate around the stomach. It may start to radiate into the thigh. And then it can radiate into the groin. And as that kidney stone gets ready to pass into the bladder, those same symptoms may present with urinating more frequently, urgency, feeling like you need to get there, feeling like you can't empty your bladder when you go. That means that that stone is low in that urinary tract, hopefully ready to pass. You uh, uh, intimated that the way to diagnose these is with some kind of imaging. What kind is that? How do you make the diagnosis? So typically today, the most common kind of imaging that we use to diagnose stones is just a CT stone protocol. So it's not the full CT scan. So we come up with ways to reduce the radiation from a CT scan. And so we use a CT scan because that essentially, if you think about it in television terms, is our high definition image. There's other ways of doing it. You can get it with just a plain x-ray. So maybe you don't need a whole CT scan. And so you can get almost a chest x-ray just of the kidneys and the bladder to localize stones. Sometimes the imaging there is a little harder to interpret because you can have bowel gas and other things that can um, influence the imaging. Also, really, we're really starting to push ultrasound imaging, especially for women when they're pregnant. We don't want them to have radiation, so we use ultrasound a lot of times to make sure that they're making urine. You can actually watch the urine jets, and you can see um, the stone, and there's some newer techniques that we use in ultrasound. But I'd say today the standard would probably be CT scan. How do you treat them? And do most people pass them? So the, the, the data on passage depends on the size and the location. So a stone less than four millimeters, they have a 50 to 80% chance of passing that stone within 40 days. So I like to say, if you have a small enough stone, we'll give you a month to try and pass it as long as it's not too symptomatic for you with some medication. We have medications that can dilate the ureters and make it easier to pass the stone, also to help with pain. Um, and if they don't pass it in a month, then chances are they're probably not going to pass it. And so that's where we delineate when they need something more advanced. The ways that we treat stones go everywhere from just taking medications. Um, there are certain stones that you can take medications that will actually dissolve those stones, like uric acid stones. You can dissolve them so you don't need any treatment. There's other stones that require surgery, and that surgery can either mean using tiny telescopes, your readerscopes and lasers to break them up. Sometimes we have to use an instrument the size of a pencil to go through the back called percutaneous nephrolithotomy to remove large stones that way. Sometimes we can just shock the stone using sound waves to break up the stone and make it into small pieces for patients to and pass. And that's where you put the patient in a tub. We used to put the patient in the tub. No more so, tub? Yeah, that was the old Dornier HM3. And uh, there's not actually, there's one system still in the United States today. Now we have newer mobile units that use gel and other substitutes instead of the tub, but we don't do the tub anymore. But that was actually still is the most effective way for breaking up stones for outside the body. If you have gotten them once, you're more likely to get them again, though, correct? Correct. So most people get their first kidney stone actually when they're between 40 and 60. And that's just how our kidneys change, how our filters change, how our diets change. Once you have one stone, the chance of you getting another stone within a year is about 15%. The chance of you getting another stone in three to five years is 35 to 40%. And the chance of getting another stone within 10 years is 50%. Um, so stones, unfortunately, sometimes can be quite the annuity, but not the one you're probably looking for. If you do pass a stone um, or it's removed in one way or another, is it important to know what kind of stone it is? Absolutely. So there's a whole bunch of different types of kidney stones and knowing what that stone is made of and how much of each mineral composition tells us a lot about how that kidney is functioning and how that filter is. And so that gives us valuable information to target so that we can come up with an individualized program specific to that individual with the stone to help prevent stones in the future. All right. Kidney stones, fairly common. They can be quite painful, as we've heard. A good treatment is available. Prevention is key. And it's important to know what kind of kidney stone you have. We've been talking to Dr. Mitchell Humphreys, Chair of Urology at Mayo Clinic's Arizona campus. Dr. Mitchell Humphreys, great to see you. Nice to have you on the program. Thank you so much for having me. Say hello to your mom. Will do.